Today's reading is from Psalms 1, 1, 1 to 6 and Psalms 10, 1 to 6. All the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the river bank, bearing fruit every season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. But not the wicked. They are like worthless chaff, scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly. For the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. Psalms 1, 1 to 6. O Lord, why do you stand so far away? Why do you hide when I am in trouble? The wicked arrogantly hunt down the poor. Let them be caught in the evil they plan for others. For they brag about their evil desires. They praise the greedy and curse the Lord. The wicked are too proud to see God. They seem to think that God is dead. Yet they succeed in everything they do. They do not see your punishment awaiting them. They sneer at all their enemies. They think nothing bad will ever happen to us. We will be free of trouble forever. This is the word of the Lord. In the season of Lent, we take a little time to uh, look a little bit at ourselves. Uh, we have, before this, taken time to look at Jesus, trying to understand who Jesus is. And every, it's also good in Lent to take time to try to understand us and the realities and the experiences that we have. And Psalm 10 is a psalm of lament. And it's a psalm that anyone in the persecuted church and the, the you know, mil- hundreds of millions of, of Christians could read and say. But Psalm 10 is also a lament that we can identify with as well. To a lesser degree, the heart of every Christian at different times complains to God. God, don't you see what's going on? God, don't you hear what's being said? God, why aren't you doing what I expected you would do? Why don't you act? Psalm 10 is expressing the experience of the psalmist and what he sees around him. And he says, the wicked take advantage of the poor and the powerless. They brag. They speak openly about the evil things that they do. They praise greed, taking money, getting money from other people, not caring about them, and they curse God. And yet, they succeed in everything they do, the psalmist says. I think that's maybe the hardest part of this psalm. The hardest part of hearing this lament is not just the brokenness around, but the fact that those who do it are succeeding. The complaint of the psalmist starts out in verse 1 is, Lord, why are you standing so far away? Why do you hide when I'm in trouble? Do you get the sense, that the feeling, the, the deep sorrow of, of going through and watching what is happening in the world around and yet also going, God, are, you're hiding. Don't you see? Don't you act? Why in the midst of the need are you so distant from what is going on? Why do you allow it? And although the psalmist keeps their faith in the midst of this and continues to trust in God that that justice will ultimately one day be done, you can hear the deep sorrow, the, the anguish that they're perplexed. Why do they succeed? Right? If if you're God, if you are who you say you are, and if the promises you make are true, why do they succeed? And I think at the end of the psalm, and and I think probably at the end of the Bible even, as we go all the way through, we don't actually have an answer to the why. We don't know why they have succeeded in those moments. And we would like to know. We would like for this somehow to make sense and go, oh, okay, that's fine. But we don't have that, as far as I can tell. And so I think sometimes that leads us to an unsettled place, kind of like the psalmist here. But it can also lead us to wonder, God, am I on the right path? 
I mean, I'm trying to do the things that you've told me, the things that you've said in your word. I'm trying to live in a Christian way, in an ethical way. But is this the right path? I mean, other people, they're having fun. Other people are gaining power to accomplish and do things, and they're getting rich. Is it really better, we can question, to believe God and to live the way that he says? And if we're not careful, this doubt can lead to what I would call shortcuts in life. Shortcuts are ways that we try to, to get somewhere a little bit faster. And, and usually when we try to get there faster and quicker, we, we end up trespassing on someone else's rights, someone else's life. So I'll give you an example of a, of a, a shortcut that I used to take when I was younger. Um, when I grew up, I grew up in New Jersey, and uh, we had this, uh, we lived on a very long street with houses on either side, and we had about a 10-minute walk to school every day. And you could go to the end of the block, and you could, you know, which is another, you know, uh, minute to the end of the block, and then around and over to the other side and cross the street and go up to the school. Uh, or you could go across the street on the driveway of the person uh, next to us and then cross over just for a moment into uh, another house where there was a fence and, uh, and climb over it and get there in about three and a half minutes early, quicker. So, so as, an, as a teenager, or, you know, actually I wasn't even a teenager, elementary school, you know, 10, 15, 10, 11, you know, very important to save those three and a half moments, minutes every day. Essential to life, right? Not really. And yet we, we took that shortcut. And I think for hundreds of thousands of years, children had been taking that same shortcut. <laughs> it, or so it seemed to us. And so it seemed appropriate and right to go ahead and do that. Now, the, the only difficulty of that um, is that we crossed over for a moment into another person's, another man's yard, an older gentleman, a, a grumpy man, we would call him, who had a fence. And of course, as we jumped over the fence, we ultimately had pushed the fence down in different places, and, and he didn't like that. So every once in a while, we'd get out there and get close, and he would shout at us, hey, you kids, run, run, run. and we would jump over, and, <laughs> and we felt oh, pretty clever, pretty good that we had gotten by again. Now, you know, he caught on to us doing this after hundreds of thousands of years, and he ended up putting some grease on the uh, fence, you know. So, you know, that was kind of like, okay, game on, you know? And so with this game continued year after year after year. And we thought we were quite clever and smart and wise, and yet we were trespassing on his property, destroying his fence to save ourselves, young, vibrant, young children, three and a half minutes per day of needed exercise. That's a shortcut. Right? I want to get some flow faster. I want to get where I want to go. And so we ended up trespassing on his life, on his property and making him mad. Shortcuts are what we do oftentimes at the expense of people. And it's easier to do a shortcut when you've seen other people do it, isn't it? And when you see they've taken that shortcut and they've succeeded because they've taken that shortcut. And the next thing you know, as you watch them succeed, we're tempted, aren't we? To say, hey, maybe that's the way to do it. I mean, look what happened to them. Look at the success they have. Look, they're rich. They're powerful. They're important. And not only that, they have seminars. For only 800 euros, you can come to my seminar and hear the keys on how you too can be successful. Maybe you've seen some of these things, right? How you can find the shortcuts of life that gets you where you want to go. And it's easy to, at some point to watch this going on and, and to say to ourselves, why not? Why not? Everyone else is doing it, right? Other people are, are doing it, and they get away with it, and it works. And we're very practical and pragmatic people. And it works. So why shouldn't I do it? It's interesting, we learned, uh, Andy has done, a, as you may have heard, a seminar on communication, and we learned about the why question on uh, Saturday and why the why question is a dangerous question, one to be careful of. Um, and the reason is, is when someone asks us why, we often uh, give them a self-justifying reason. And when we speak it, we reinforce that that's reality. It doesn't open us up, the why question usually. It, it's not helpful. And in as many ways, what happens is, is we start to, to reinforce our bias 
And we, we do it, and people ask, why? Well, because other people are doing it, because it works, because it, it's useful. And we're not really thinking, is this hurting or harming someone else in the process? It takes courage not to join other people in the inappropriate shortcuts to success. It takes faith. It takes faith in God to say, no, I won't do what's wrong, but I will instead wait for your justice to come, even though it's not yet happened in my life, as I watch other people. And I'm sure one of the challenges you and I face is sometimes we see people take shortcuts, inappropriate shortcuts, and they get away with it. And they get ahead of us. And they make more money from us. And they sometimes seem happier than us. And they have things that we might wish that we could have. But we don't. And the temptation is to go and to follow in that. And I want to suggest to you that why is probably the wrong question to ask. The psalmist in Psalm 10 in the sense underneath it is, is kind of asking, why, why is the justice not here? Why did they succeed? What is the question that we should ask, that we should spend our time on? It says, Lord, in, in, in the world, the way it is, the brokenness, and, and that oftentimes people will do the wrong thing, what do you want me to do? Can I follow? Or should I go in a different direction? What path? Is there for me to follow that's right and good? And Psalm 1 really answers the what question. And it's a great psalm to meditate and to focus on and and to think about. And we're just going to touch it for a moment. But it's interesting that Psalm 1 is, is the long view of life. If you look at it, it's the long view. It's not the short view. And Psalm 10 is that moment of stress and difficulty and challenge when we're lamenting, when we're complaining to God and we feel it. But Psalm 1 steps back and says, but look at the big beginning to end of life. Look where that leads when you take the shortcut. And look where it leads when you make the choice to be on the right path, the the path that that has blessing in it. And that's why Psalm 1 is a wisdom song, Psalm. So Psalm 10 is a lament psalm, and it's great for lamenting, and it's a great one to use. But Psalm 1 is a psalm that you go and look at when you want to gain wisdom. And wisdom is the thing that the Scripture again and again says to us, go get it. Search for it. Climb the highest mountain for it. Because when you have wisdom, you'll know how to navigate the challenges of life. And oftentimes we get wisdom by making mistakes. And so if you've taken shortcuts, you have the opportunity to gain wisdom by having taken that shortcut. Don't stay on the shortcut, but you can learn from the mistakes that you've made, the mistakes that I've made. But Psalm 1 reminds us that there are two paths in life and that they lead to two different outcomes, two different places. And it reminds us that we're supposed to engage our mind how important it is what we think. To use our minds, not just to react and to respond emotionally. We'll do that. But to engage our brains and to engage our minds with God and to think about what will happen if I do this. What does this mean? Who will be hurt? Who will be helped if I make this choice or not? Our minds make a huge difference. And so it tells us the person who finds happiness or joy or the blessed person will not find that blessing, that happiness, that joy in the company or in the ways or the words of those who do evil, who live apart from God. And it kind of separates out three ways that we can be influenced by those who do what's wrong. The first is that we kind of take advice from them. So it's really easy in life, and we engage with all kinds of different people, uh, positive people, not so positive people, and it's great. It's easy for us to, to say, you know, you've been successful. You've done well. What advice would you give me? And if we take advice from those that are doing what's wrong, it's more likely that we'll do wrong. And then the next step is, is not just that, but it's not just taking the advice, but joining with them in doing it. That's the next step away. And, and the last step is not just joining them, but, but joining them in scoffing at other people and say, oh, that's, that's so stupid. Oh, you're so foolish. Oh, you, you really should do this because this is why you're poor. This is why you don't have what I have. And we scoff. And, and we know this. We see this, right? 
It happens all the time around us. Discoverers. And what this psalm tells us is don't join. Don't listen to their advice. Don't join them in doing wrong, in taking the shortcut with them. And don't find yourself scoffing at other people who don't have what you have. That's the wrong path. That's the wrong way of life. For example, maybe take the idea of handling money. What does the world say? What do people say? And what does God say? You know, most people in the world would say, you have money, it's yours. It's yours. You know what the Bible says, what God says? The money you have is God's. And you are a manager of his money. The question, only question is, are we a good manager? Or are we a bad manager? And instead of, this is my money, what, what do I want to do with it? It's, this is God's money. What does he want to be done with his money in our life? We, we can have a perspective, and often people do in, in this world, of saying, I need to hoard as much money as I can because I don't know what the future will bring. And so I've got I've to keep as much as I can for me because things could get really bad, and I don't know what will happen in the future. But the, what God tells us is, is be generous with your money. Give it away. You know, and why can we do that with confidence? Because God is looking after us. God is taking care of us. God can supply more. It's not limited. We don't have to hoard it. And really the reality is, is the best way to, to be free from money, from the love of money, from having money control you, give it away. That, I can tell you're excited about that, aren't you? <laughs> right? When we give it away, we're freed. Why? It's no longer ours, right? That's what Paul says to Timothy to teach the church. Don't, those who have wealth in this world, tell them to be generous, to give it away, and that way it's, they're not a slave to the money that they have because it's not theirs. It's mine. And so having that different perspective makes a big difference. And the money you have, is it for your pleasure? For you to do what you want to make yourself happy or is it to make God happy? Is it to, to be able to use in such a way that pleases him that he says, that's what I want to happen in this world. Thank you for using the money I gave you to accomplish my purposes in this world, which includes taking care of yourself. But it isn't just about taking care of yourself. Can you see the different paths that this takes us if we listen just to the advice of, of people in the world? Instead of listening to what God says is the wise path, the wise way to go. The passage says that the result of those who make the choices of the wicked, who listen to their advice, who join them and who scoff at other people, is that they're like chaff. Now, this, the idea of chaff is, is basically like in wheat or corn. There's an outer shell, and as you let it dry, and they would throw it up in the air, and the chaff would blow away. And then you'd have what's really of value, which is the kernel, um, the grain that you would use to make, make something to, that's useful and helpful. But the chaff was not useful for anything. In fact, it wasn't even good for a fire. It just, and it's gone. And the idea here is God says those who take advice from the wicked, those who, who follow in their way, join their group, and those who scoff are, are lightweights. They're not people of substance at all because they took the ways around. They didn't learn what life was about. They're useless. They have no value to God. Oftentimes, they're not even value to other people. They cause more harm than good. And they're rootless. A chaff has no root. And we'll see in a moment that that's really an important contrast, to have roots where you can be nourished and grow. And Craig, Craig he says in his commentary that these people's end is judgment, collapse, and expulsion. You know, that's, that's the road. That's the path. That's the big picture. That's where it leads. And yes, justice yet has not yet come, but it will come. And this is a choice. See, wisdom tells us the, the options and gives us a choice. It's not like they have to stay on that. And you and I oftentimes take shortcuts. And if you have, you don't have to stay on that road. That's the great thing about repentance. I don't know if you know the word repentance means you're going this way and you say, this is the wrong way. And you go that way, the right way. 
And the great thing is, as long as we eat and breathe and live, we have the chance to make a change, to go in a better, a different direction, to get on God's path. And by the way, Christians can get on the wrong path too, you know? And we often do because we're not listening to God. We're listening to someone else or something else. But this path of the wicked is contrasted with the other path, the path that God calls us to, that God leads us on. And this is the path where a person's mind, their perspectives, and their actions are shaped by what God says. It it uses this wonderful word that they delight in the law of the Lord, the words of God, that they delight in God's word. They think it over again and again. They meditate on it. They they pull out of it good things. And our mind is to feed on God's eternal perspective that's found in his word. Delight is often a missing ingredient in our life. You think about what is it you delight in? What is delightful to you that you enjoy, that means a lot to you, that you can't wait to do or be a part of or enjoy. The psalmist says, if you learn to delight in what God says, then you'll be the blessed person. You'll be the joyful person. You can be the happy person who's on that road because you've learned what it is that is worthy of your delight. And by the way, delight isn't something you have to stir up, right? You don't have to get in front of your favorite meal and go, I should really like this. You go, ah, look at this. Wow, I can tell those of you who are foodies and those who are not. Some of you are like, yeah, it's not so big deal. And others of you are like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's right. What do you delight in? What's delightful to you? What, what draws joy out of you? The psalmist says, delight. Those who learn to delight in what God has to say. Those are the people that will be happy. And, and you know, sometimes when you read what Jesus says or, or things in the Old Testament or what Paul writes to the churches, sometimes it's a little confusing, a little hard to hear. But as you meditate on it and think about it, maybe talk to someone else about it in a Bible study with a friend, you know, you can start to see the wisdom in it. You can start to say, you know, that makes a lot of sense. You know, and some things are just really delightful, right? Jesus, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I'm reading right now for Lent, uh, which Jody had suggested this idea of reading through the Gospels and taking two a day. So if, you're, if you haven't been doing it, you think that's a good idea, you can jump in. There's, no, one's, no one's keeping score, okay? You can just jump in. Start at Matthew or, if you want, Luke and just jump in. But one of the things I love about Jesus is you read Jesus and you kind of go, yeah, that's my guy. He's doing the right things. It's exciting, Finally, someone is standing up to the poor and someone is standing up to the arrogant and say, no, this is not right. It's delightful to read Jesus, to see what he says. And I go, I want to follow that guy. I want to live that life with him. I want to be on that path. See, that's what delighting is all about. And the person who learns to delight is the person who finds the happiness and blessedness that can be there even when things are bad. Even when other things don't work out. Even when other people are getting ahead. Because we're learning to acquire and to apply wisdom. And that creates a different kind of life. Listen to the kind of life that it it creates, the images that, that are given here. It's like a tree planted by streams of water. Now, it seems like Luxembourg has been for the last few days a living stream of water from the sky all the time. Right? And it is pretty green. But a while ago, we were on, in Egypt on the Nile, and it was really interesting that you look a little bit like 400 meters, 500 meters beyond the, the Nile, and it's just desolate. I mean, it's just the same color, gray, sand, rock. It's just like there's nothing alive there. And then as it gets closer to the river, this, this green spot. You know, this this is green and lush and you can just see being close to that source of life was a place that nourished and allowed things to grow all year round. Not just one time, but they took that source from the river and that's the idea here is that this, they're, they're close to and they receive this source. Their roots are pulling up the nutrients in the water. And it's really interesting because some of the images of Scripture 
Jesus kind of uses this imagery in, in John 15. Paul talks about it uh, later on uh, in Ephesians, but it talks about having our lives rooted in the love of God. See, that's our living water. That's our stream. And when that love of God is coming up through our roots, then we are like a tree and we bear fruit in our season. It doesn't mean we bear fruit all the time. I think one of the challenges we face in life is that people expect us to bear fruit all the time, every day, no matter what. No rest. And see, that's not the way it works. We bear fruit in season. But in season, we bear fruit because we have this source coming from within us, the love of God, and fruit at the right time will come. And when the drought comes, when things are bad around us, see, these trees that, that are in the love of God, that are being fed by the stream, they have a different source, and so the circumstances around them don't affect them in the same way. It's not the end. They don't wither because they have found that God is reliable, a reliable source in their life. This life is the one that prospers. It's a life where God produces what he wants in our lives, which may not be for you to be rich or famous or powerful or on top. It might. But that's not the promise here. <laughs> the promise is that you and I can have a happy, blessed joyful life as we stay on God's path and as we are firmly rooted in his love and allow him to produce his fruit in time. See the big perspective, the long term is so important in this. And at the end of the Psalm when it says this, is this is the life that God watches over. Did you see that? See, this says God is near even when it doesn't feel like he's near. And there are those moments. There are those Psalm 10 moments. We go, are you hiding? <laughs> but Psalm 1 says, us, no, it feels like that. But the reality is that God is always near to those who walk on this path, who delight in his word, and who think about what it means and try to bring it and apply it into their life. See, the wicked want to grab everything they can and, and get now and, and secure it and hold on to it. And that's, by the way, a faith position, right? they trusting that by doing that and by taking all the shortcuts and by harming other people, they can get away with it, that there's no judgment, that God's not there. That's a faith position that they're living out. You and I are called to live a different faith position, right? And we'll find out who's right and who's wrong. And the great thing is God always invites us again and again, everyone to come back to the right path. And we have that opportunity as long as we live. Jesus maybe put it this way, maybe it's helpful. In Matthew 6, he says this, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. And when we treasure and delight in God's word and who God is and what he says, then we will delight in that. And that will make a certain kind of life a life of joy. The best way to live is to choose not to follow the shortcuts. There is one path that God says he wants us to be on, and that's delighting in his word. And as we do that, as we delight in who God is in his word, guess what? That temptation to take the shortcut goes away. And you, you know why that happens? Because when you're delighting in something, you don't want to rush it, do you? You don't want to say, oh, I can't wait for this to be over. Right? When you delight in something, you slow down. You walk slow or stop. You want it to last. And see, when we're trying to take a shortcut, we're trying to get somewhere quick. But those who delight are happy to go slow. Because they want to enjoy that thing that delights them the most. So if, like me, sometimes you're in a big rush, it may be an indication that you found some things to delight in that aren't worthy of it. And so the privilege we have is to be invited 
to walk on this path where joy, happiness, and blessedness can be found. Because it says this, blessed are those who delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit in each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all that they do. For the Lord watches over the path of the godly. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we acknowledge that we have tread lots of different paths. And we have taken many different shortcuts, and Lord, before us are other shortcuts that it's tempting to take. And others tell us that we should do it. Father, help us to listen to the voice of wisdom that says, first and foremost, delight in what God says. Meditate on it. Think about it. Let it soak in us so that we can know and enjoy and delight in who you are and therefore be grounded in your love so that the fruit of our lives can be the fruit that you desire. And that we can know whether we feel it or not that your presence is right there and that you are guarding our path until the end. Help us wherever each one of us are at to be back on that path. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.